what is the real problem confronting Jews and Jewish life today? <coughs> Jews understand a crisis. <coughs> when Jews are confronted with a crisis, they respond. If tomorrow there was a threat of invasion on Israel's borders, there would hardly be a Jewish community in the world that would not respond warmly, spontaneously, generously. If there was an outbreak of persecution, Jews would immediately sense the danger and they would rally in an hour of crisis. What we don't understand is a different thing. Not a crisis, but a creeping paralysis. A gradual, creeping paralysis in Jewish life, which is robbing world Jewry, even today, of at least 50% of its sons and daughters. When I tell you that in England, a traditional and a conservative community, at least, at least 50% of Jewish children receive no form of Jewish education whatsoever. And of the 50% who do, I'd say more than half, receive what can best be described as a smattering of ignorance. And when you bear in mind that the situation in America is immeasurably worse than in England, I think you will see that I'm not exaggerating when I say that we are faced with a subtle, insidious, and gradual disease which is all the more dangerous because we aren't aware of how acute this creeping paralysis of Jewish life has become. Jewish life stands in danger today for another reason. Because Jewish life is no longer self-contained. <coughs> there was a time when Jews lived in the villages in the towns of Eastern Europe. And when the Jew had not only a Jewish home, he had a completely Jewish environment. In the street in which he walked, he would hear Yiddish spoken. Or if you don't need the example of uh, uh, the Aristoc or Kovner or Wilner or Warsaw or Lodge, was there not a similar time? I'm told there was in areas like Durnfontein, as there was in Whitechapel in London, where whole areas were densely populated by Jews, and where Jewish life flooded out of the home into the street. That has ended. Jews have spread away. And moreover, with new mass industrialized entertainment, whereby with the turn of a knob we have the radio, where we have compulsory education, which is a praiseworthy thing, where children go to secondary schools and go on to university, and where you may be certain that in a generation or two, the student who goes to university will in no way be exceptional. University in one generation's time will be accepted as as normal as secondary school is today. In this world, the Jewish individuality is being lost. And the problem becomes increasingly more acute. How is the Jew to retain his Jewishness? And moreover, not only how is he to retain his Jewishness, but why should a Jew remain a Jew at all? Young people are growing up with a question which not all parents can answer. And the question is, why should I be a Jew? What advantage is there in being a Jew? And merely to say to modern children that you are a Jew because you were born a Jew and therefore you have to remain a Jew is no longer enough. Speaking for myself, knowing my own attitude to life and my own temperament, I would not accept an accident of birth as something final molding my whole destiny if I resented it. If I resented being a Jew and didn't know why I have to be a Jew, I would fight against it. I wouldn't be reconciled merely to an accident and carry it as a burden all the days of my life. And I certainly wouldn't give it to my children. And if you say the Jew can't assimilate, it isn't true because individual Jews have assimilated. In the whole of Jewish history you will find 
that were as clowny trial, the community can't assimilate. Ready is trial, the individual has assimilated. And uh, to accept this fact that having been born a Jew, therefore you have to make the best of a bad job and go on living as a Jew, without any knowledge of what this Judaism is, without any understanding of what it is that makes Judaism a pride and a blessing and a privilege, why should Jewish youth accept it? If they rebel against it, what logical basis is there for censuring them or disapproving of their rebellion? Now, this is the state of affairs that I see to a greater or lesser extent in all the communities which I visit. And I'm of the opinion that the foremost and the vital issue confronting Jews is today Jewish education. And Jewish education, which is the responsibility not only of the parent, it used to be, and it should be. It should be even today. But the number of Jewish homes that can be regarded as good Jewish homes is not on the increase. And therefore, the education of the Jewish child has become a communal responsibility. I think it is advisable that I should speak for a while about my attitude towards Jewish schools. I am all in favour of Jews associating with Christians, and I want to stress two words, Jews and Christians. Where you have a Jew who knows why he is a Jew, who has a learned awareness and a sense of pride in his Jewishness, that man will associate with a Christian without any feeling of inferiority whatsoever. Because he does not equate difference with inferiority. And where two men have roots in their own tradition, the Jew being a Jew and the Christian being a Christian, they can associate as friends, as equals, and the tolerance between them is a virtue because no man conceives of his essence and each one can tolerate the difference in the other. But where you have a young man growing up who is not a learned Jew, who knows nothing about his Jewishness, who is a complete Amhaaret, a complete ignoramus, he isn't a Jew, he is, and mark these words, he is a non-Christian of Jewish parentage a non-Christian of Jewish parentage. He is not a Christian, he is not a Jew. All he knows is that there was an accident at birth. And of course he shouts he is proud to be a Jew. But what is the nature of this pride that is rooted in ignorance? How are you proud of something of which you're completely unaware and unlearned? This type of non-Christian of Jewish parentage, when he seeks to associate himself with a Christian and tries to enter into certain coveted circles that barely tolerate him and they tolerate him when they do on their terms he doesn't associate as an equal he is there as an inferior and then toleration becomes not a noble bond of friendship it becomes an act of charity and that act of charity demands a price. And that price is one's self-respect and the respect of a person who tolerates you. I've always maintained that a Jewish child in a Jewish school has one great blessing. He has a sense in his early years of belonging. He feels secure. He feels that he belongs in this school without any reservation whatsoever. I went to a non-Jewish school. I wasn't unhappy. I went to a non-Jewish school. In fact, I would say I was reasonably happy. It's fairly popular. But I always felt that I could not identify myself completely with the school to which I went. Various factors. On Yom Tov, I couldn't go to school. When the school had prayers, I remained back in the classroom. 
When they sang hymns, I couldn't go out into the school hall assembly. I felt always that I was part of the school and yet not part of the school. I loved cricket. I was reasonably good at it. I could never get into the first 11 because I couldn't play on Shabbat. I loved football. I was excluded from the school team for the same reason. The school wasn't to blame. It wasn't direct anti-Semitism. But in the nature of the situation, I was a member of the school and yet not completely identifiable with the whole. And always, ladies and gentlemen, always, when a person has to live in a world of two cultures, he inevitably will make one of them a subculture. I repeat this because educationally it's important. It applies not only to Jews. It applies to all sections of humanity. When a person lives in two world cultures, he tends to make one of them a subculture. And if he finds that this subculture makes him feel different, he resents it. Because I and my Jewish colleagues felt that it was our Jewishness that kept us out of the first dilemma. That our Jewishness made us feel that we could not identify ourselves completely with the school as a whole. We resented our Jewishness. That was the burden. That was the curse. I feel that to some extent this confidence Happy experience is to a greater or lesser degree the part of a Jewish child when it goes to a non-Jewish school. I realize fully that in the world that it is at present constituted, the majority of Jewish children will continue to go to mixed schools. And it would be an act of idiocy on the part of anybody to denounce mixed schools. But I take a positive attitude and advocate, wherever possible, Jewish schools as well. Because I maintain that within these Jewish schools, the child will grow up to be a more balanced, a more harmonious, a happier, a more secure human personality. Now, some parents have often said to me, uh, you know, my child's going to encounter anti-Semitism. He's going to meet anti-Semitism sooner or later. Why not let him meet it at school? It will happen to him. Now, a Jew without learning is utterly defenseless. A Jew without knowledge is utterly defenseless. The only defense that a Jew has had throughout all the ages has been Jewish learning. What criminal folly it is to take a child or even a young adolescent and expose him to the feeling of discrimination and in some schools all over the world even taunts and abuse of discrimination and expect that child to resist. With what shall the child resist? What defense mechanism has it got? The child is bound to be wounded and scarred as a human being. If a Jewish mother sees a child with a single little spot, immediately it will put the child to bed and call the doctor and fuss around. But if a child has wounds in the heart that it can't even disclose, if during its impressionable years it has been taunted and made to feel excluded from a coveted circle of friends, isn't that more serious than an external disease which can be treated with immediate care and attention? Why do we neglect this whole question of the child's well-being during its early years and believe it's all right, the child will be toughened, he will develop an immunity, he will stand up for himself. More likely than not, he will in later life, unconsciously or subconsciously, rebel against the Judaism which he felt was the cause that exposed him to these humiliations. I maintain, if you keep a child during its early years in an environment where it feels secure, that child will be a well-balanced and harmonious personality and be able to face all manner of men 
with confidence and stability. And I have not only a theory about this, I'm not theorizing, I have years and years of experience. Very frequently we found that those who had been to some snob English public school were the ones who cringed, who were the psychopaths and wanted to hide their Judaism when they mixed with their non-Jewish fellow citizens, either in national service or in the university. I was speaking to a young boy who had been at Carmel College and now is at Balliol, Oxford and gained a first-class open scholarship there. And I asked him how he associated with all his Christian fellow students. And he said, Rabbi, I don't feel any difference at all. Very, very well indeed. And how do the others? He said, well, do you know, I've got many more Christian friends than those Jewish boys who came from, and he mentioned, well-known English schools. He said, and I've discussed it with them. And they admit it too. And they say the reason must be that they, during their school years, felt that they belonged to a minority. But as I, during my school years, never had the feeling that I was a member of a minority. I belonged completely to the school. And now a failure, I don't feel that I'm a member of a minority. <coughs> and then let me add one more argument. The gentleman made an interesting point. He said that he had been a member of a school in Dunfontaine, which, no not a Jewish school in which people taught Judaism, was almost 99% of Jewish population. This was because the people living in the area were almost totally Jewish. Now we had the same thing in Whitechapel in the East End of London. There were schools which were not Jewish schools, but in which the total population was Jewish because the whole area in which the school was placed was populated by Jews. One would assume, therefore, one would assume that those who went to such schools where they mixed only with fellow Jews should be incapable of associating with Christians in later life. But it's not a fact. It's not a fact. The very reverse is the truth. And he mixes as a man with knowledge, with pride, and with self-respect. Because these are the qualities that emerge from learning. And then look what happens in our whole community. It's absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating, when you see that there is hardly one sphere of philanthropic, cultural, or sporting activity in which the Jew does not separate himself. We have, in England, I don't know about South Africa, Jewish hospitals, a Jewish orphanage, Jewish home for the blind, Jewish home for the aged, a Jewish home for spackers, Jewish golf clubs, Jewish social clubs, Jewish boys clubs, Jewish lads brigades, Jewish dramatic societies, Jewish symphony orchestras. In fact, there's nothing, no sphere of activity in which you haven't got uh, some Jewish branch. Not to ask myself, why do we need these Jewish things? Sometimes I think I'm even opposed to them. Yet everywhere, the Jew caters to his own convenience because fundamentally he feels a little happier in Jewish environments than in non-Jewish environments. Every minority does. It's not only Jews with Jews, it's Irishmen with Irishmen. A minority feels more at ease within its own minority. It's not a specifically Jewish problem at all. But in the one sphere where separatism, not apartheid, separatism, distinctiveness has merit in the sphere of teaching children why they are Jews, there we suddenly say we mustn't separate ourselves. It's a world that is topsy-turvy. I would say, educate young Jews and make them secure personalities, and they will feel at ease in mixing with non-Jewish society in later life. Scar the child, harm him, humiliate him when he is young, and he will never want to mix with non-Jews when he grows up. Let us give our children a thoroughly good education, and then we have given them the most precious heritage that a father can possibly give to a child. Of course, 
Jewish schools will not cater for all children. Of course, Jewish children will go to mixed schools. And of course, we have to take care of their education as well. I have never spoken against mixed schools. I've spoken against those narrow-minded people who deny the right of Jewish children to go to Jewish schools. In England, almost all the Catholic children go to Catholic schools. In fact, every great English public school is a denominational school. Eton isn't a non-conformist school, it's Anglican. Winchester is Anglican. Leighton Park is Quaker. Bootham is Quaker. Ampleforth is Roman Catholic. Ackworth is Methodist. Carmel College is Jewish. Carmel College is a Jewish public school, has as much moral right to provide education for Jewish children as the Catholics, the Anglicans, the Methodists, the Quakers, and the Baptists for their children. And the Jewish boy who will come from Carmel College will be as good a citizen and perhaps even better because he will feel secure in the heritage that gives him distinctiveness. No one denies that parents can choose to send their children to Eton or Winchester if they wish. Parents wish to take Jewish children and send them to Winchester where they will feel their difference and where they will be segregated because there they will be a minority segregated within a majority. If the parent chooses to do that, it's his right and his moral responsibility. But which logical or reasonable minded man denies the right of a Jewish parent to choose to educate his child in a harmonious, completely well-balanced Jewish environment where the child feels in his early years that this is his school in totality? that he belongs as a whole and not only in a part. For the other children, good Talmaturas, good evening classes, education of the highest quality. Because without education, we cannot exist because we have no reason for existence. And the child will not know why he should live as a Jew. And when the child rebels, the rebel is not the one who should be condemned, but often the parents and the community and the environment that produce that rebel through their neglect. And so to me the paramount issue in Jewish life everywhere is the challenge of education.